storm clouds overhead when they discharge their moisture as rain. Wherever rain falls on land, it runs from high ground to lower, in gullies, and torrents. These join to form larger streams until they reach the sea as great rivers. Above land and sea, the sun causes water to evaporate and rise as clouds and again rain falls to feed our streams. This running water is an endless source of power. Long ago, before man thought of harnessing the power of rivers, he used them as water highways. But on nearly every stream on which man has ever traveled, he sooner or later found his way blocked by waterfalls, or rapids, which he has looked upon as a hindrance to his progress. It was evident that this rushing water had power in it, but many centuries passed before the waterfall became a help rather than a hindrance to man. When early pioneers did not find waterfalls where they could use this power, they built dams like this on small streams and thus made artificial waterfalls. They placed water wheels so that the force of the falling water would turn them. To the water wheel they fastened an axle or shaft which turned with the wheel. Inside the mill they used the turning shaft to grind grain and to perform other work for them. This map shows the many streams in the eastern part of the United States which the early colonists used to provide water power. When the needs of rapidly growing industries demanded greater power, most of these early mills were abandoned. One of the best of these new forms of power was steam, which made possible larger factories and mills. During the 19th century, many factories like this were built. But for steam power, coal was required to heat the furnaces, and millions of tons of coal were consumed each year. Since it was expensive to transport coal, many large factories were built within easy reach of the coal field. The dark portions of this map show coal fields. And here are many industrial cities which grew up around them. When the world's supply of coal began to be used at an increasing rate, men turned again to the waterfall in their search for greater sources of power. Here, for example, was an immense source of power available as long as the water from the Great Lakes continued to plunge over Niagara's rocky rim. Engineers found a way to change this water power into electrical power. At the base of the Niagara Falls, we see today the giant hydroelectric plant which generates electrical energy from the force of falling water. At the head of the falls, we see the water entering the plant through canals. As it enters, it is led into pipes called penstocks, through which it shoots downward 180 feet to the turbines below. Here are the great turbines, huge water wheels enclosed in metal cases, powerful modern successors to the old mill wheel. Now let us see how a turbine works. Here are the inlet valves where the water enters, the cup-shaped paddles against which it strikes, and the outlet valve through which the used-up water flows out. The water rushes through the inlet valve, hurls its energy against the paddles of the water wheel, and flows quietly into the river below. As the huge wheel moves, it turns a shaft connected with the machines above a generator which transforms the energy of the falling water into electrical energy. Here are the generators which thus produce electricity at Niagara Falls. Out over the wires the electric power flows. It is carried for long distances, often hundreds of miles, whereas the early mill had to be built quite close to the waterfall. Finally, we see these electric wires entering this large factory 
which caps the power far from its source. Such plants use this electric power in greater quantities than the largest steam units ordinarily supply. Thus, larger and larger industries are made possible. On the other hand, the ease with which electric power is made available has affected every one of us, even in our homes. Small electric power devices have changed household tasks from such back-breaking drudgery as the old washboard method to light, pleasant work. Electricity on the farm has done away with such wearisome labour as hand churning. The modern way is to let electricity turn the turn. It was largely to meet the needs of farmers that there was built Boulder Dam in Arizona. The dam itself is 727 feet high. Water falling from this height has great power and produces a continuous supply of electrical energy equal to almost 2 million horsepower. At the base of the dam are the turbines and generators which change the water power into electric power. Boulder Dam serves five states. It furnishes them with electric power, with water for irrigation and drinking purposes. It helps to control the water in the river and prevents floods. Here are some water power plants in the United States. We've already spoken of the Niagara Falls plant. The Tennessee Valley dams lie to the south. Boulder Dam, which we just saw, is in the southwest. In the extreme northwest, are the power resources of the Columbia River. Here are the Grand Coulee and the Bonville Dam. Yet the United States is making use of only one-fourth of its water power. There has been even less development in South America. In Brazil and Argentina, the great power resources of the upper tributaries of the Orinoco, the Amazon and the Parana, are largely untouched. Here, for example, are the great Uguasu Falls on the Parana. This lack of development is due partly to the wild nature of the country and partly to the simple life and simple wants of a large part of the population. In Europe, however, water power has been even more intensively developed than in the United States. Switzerland makes use of more than 75% of her water power. Italy and Germany are close behind. Russia has planned even more extensive use of her water power. Here are the Dnieperstroy power station on the Dnieper River. In Africa, little use has been made of water power. In the Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River, we see going to waste the splendid strength of the giant waterfall. In the same way, the great resources of the Congo, Niger, and Nile rivers are little used, because the natives have so far made few demands upon mechanical energy. Furthermore, hydroelectric plants are costly. Within a limited area, the demand is still small. To carry the current to Europe would be uneconomic. Asia, like Africa, uses little of its water power. In the great river systems of the Tigris and Euphrates, the Indus, the Ganges, the Mekong, Yangtze Kiang, Hoang Ho and Amor, lies potential power far greater than in the United States. But in Asia, where coolies still irrigate the land and saw timber by these old methods, More than half of mankind still relies on muscle power to get its work done. Someday these people may advance to the use of labor-saving machines. Someday we may discover how to use the limitless power of sea waves and tides now dashed to waste against our shores.